The biggest thing I would say is to encourage someone to be intentional early. Business of Architecture, episode 277. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. Today's guest is Aaron Morris. Aaron Morris is the president of Aaron Morris Architects, a design-focused architecture firm based out of Newport Beach, California. In today's episode, you'll discover the two main things that helped Aaron go from overwhelmed operator to empowered owner. You'll discover how to build a business around your life and not the other way around. You'll also discover how Erin went from wanting literally to walk away from her architectural practice through the stress and overwhelm to having an impactful practice that gives her freedom and creative fulfillment. If you haven't already, get free instant access to the four-part architecture firm profit map gift, especially for podcast listeners by going to freearchitectgift.com. Enter your best email address on that page and you will get instant access. I want to give a special thanks to iTunes user NWA Twigs who left a review over on iTunes. Uh, Twigs says, this podcast helped inspire me to get into architecture after not being able to after college. So I get that a lot of times right out of college, it can be a tough job market, but congratulations user Twigs on hanging in there. And thank you so much for the podcast review. If you're listening or watching this and you haven't left a review on iTunes, I'd very much appreciate that. You can do that by visiting the blog Business of Architecture, clicking on the iTunes logo or going straight to iTunes from your phone. Now with that, let's get right into today's show. Hello, Aaron, and welcome to the Business of Architecture. Hi, thanks for having me, Nick. Aaron, give us an overview of background of how you came to be a firm owner. Tell me a bit about your journey of ending up running a firm. I would call myself an accidental business owner. Um, for me, the downturn aligned um, when I was having my first child, which was actually great. Um, the The layoff came right as it was a great time for me to have some personal time off. And after that, I didn't see myself going to work for a firm in the capacity that I knew um, firm employees to, to operate in, you know, full full-time schedules, um, that level of responsibility. So a friend reached out and had um, some project needs that were within my wheelhouse. And I was interested in these opportunities because I had a vision for the lifestyle or the life or my best life that I wanted to live, meaning um, a certain schedule. We travel fairly often, but I still wanted to have creative expression outside of, of, of the life that I was leading away from work because the opportunities were, were really driven through the vision of my personal life. Um, it became clear fairly early on to, you know, to hire an employee and then eventually a, another employee um, so that I could be uh, traveling or at the park with my kids or, or whatever. So I, uh, I felt uh, fell into it that way. So that is really how I came to be a business owner. And that took a new life uh, when we outgrew our relationship with the contractor uh, that we that we had joined with for a number of years. And so it was suddenly very clear to me that, you know, we're on our own, we're, we're having our own office, and we're making a lot of choices. And it, it, after years of operating, I realized, oh, we are a business and we do need to make choices as a business. So that, uh, that realization didn't come until a few years into the, uh, into the operations. So I'm, I'm hearing from you, Erin, that for you, lifestyle was very important with how you structured the firm. Correct, correct. It was a primary driver. Um, so it informed some things, like I mentioned about when to hire, when not to hire, um, but it, it didn't inform anything relative to the business itself, obviously, you know, making those choices, you know, can we invest here? Do we spend money there? Do we say yes to this? Do we say no to that? All these other business decisions uh, weren't really, it wasn't intentional to set out and say, oh, I, I have this vision for a firm and I'm going to run it like this. And, and our 
you know, it's going to be A, B, and C. It's a little bit more reactionary and seeing an opportunity to have that lifestyle, but still to, um, to utilize all those skills and innate needs and desires to, you know, to, to want to, to want to do both, to want to have it all. If you will. And tell me about that journey. Was that, um, have you accomplished that vision of, of that lifestyle business, the freedom and flexibility that you'd like to have? Uh, if so, how did that journey go? What were some of the challenges and struggles you had along the way doing that? One of the main challenges was authorizing myself to see that vision through. For example, for many years, maybe subconsciously, I believed that having those privileges needed to come at the expense of, of having a profitable firm or being fairly compensated or creating boundaries around business, um, even though, you know, around working hours or, you know, when to take client calls and, and, and all that. So that was the main challenge. And um, obviously working with the AFF program has really informed a lot of, really authorized me to, to really make real on what was an inkling of a, of a vision to really authorize it and go, no, you know what, there can be somebody in charge of each item. I don't have to be the figurehead or the person, you know, taking every call or, or um, being the leader on each portion of the business. So for how long were you in that state where you were the one taking every call and getting into every part of the business? Years, um, probably five years um, with help. I mean, there was organic growth happening at the same time, meaning in the commercial sector, we have a lot of repeat clients. So it, it wasn't, we weren't able to look at each project anew and say, okay, where does this fit on the schedule? How does this work? Um, you know, you want, once you have a client, you really want to say yes to them. And because it is tenant driven work, there's often leases and uh, it's a pretty crushing environment right up right now for, for people signing leases. Uh, speed is very important. So I would say for two years, it was, a, I was the primary lead. And then there was probably another two years where, the staff was extremely competent, but still perhaps not clear on their role. And uh, so, so it was quite some time. How did you avoid the trap of hiring on staff and then just finding that you're even more busy now because you have to manage the staff and correct things that they're doing? Sheer luck. Um, I happened to hire someone who did the exact same job for an architect that I knew who had a very similar project type. So she was very familiar with the deliverables and the path. Um, so she had a lot of autonomy. Um, so it was really more about aligning with the right person. Uh, but even still, Everyone wants to know what their role is. Everyone, we we call it whack-a-mole, where you know you're 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 just hitting the the thing that pops up next, and it was just two people standing there with bats rather than one person standing there with bats. So we weren't any more well organized. There was just more more people swinging at the moles essentially. So um, it it allowed us to it expanded the bandwidth a bit but it didn't get to the, the crux of, you know, of what we were trying to do, which is set up a more uh, tiered organization with, with distinct roles. How did the whack-a-mole situation, as we'll call it, since you've referenced it as that, how did that affect the actual operations of the business? In some ways, the whack-a-mole needing to shift and cover and, you know, deal with what comes next, I still believe is a little bit inherent to small teams, meaning you have to be able to fill in where somebody else flexes over. But it is definitely not the ideal way to run a business. 
Um, it is a little confusing for employees. It can be confusing for clients, but mainly it just creates more work. So if I'm dealing with something, then I'm going to hand it off. I need to make sure somebody, we're both having the same full dialogue, for example, with the client, because we both have to have all of the information at all times. Uh, so it is, it's just less uh, efficient in terms of everyone's time and energy. And how did that less efficiency, how did that affect the business itself? I would say the business was growing in spite of that. Um, thankfully, because we worked so closely together, the team still comes off in a very, you know, it's still very cohesive, I think, in terms of the client experience. They're, they're happy and they, they keep coming back. Um, however, from a business perspective, it's difficult to, to grow or to create any stability or predictability. Um, so in that way, it was a bit challenging uh, because if you're, you know, you're reinventing the wheel each time, it's just sucking up a lot of, a lot of bandwidth. And how did that affect, did that have any effect on your personal life? I mean, of course it does, right? Everything that is happening in business when you're a business owner impacts your personal life. I, I will say because I had a very intentional, uh, I was intentional, it was intentional from the outset that business and life would be separate. It didn't overlap as much as one would think once we got on the path of, of sort of once I got out of the owner operator scenario that I said like lasted a couple of years, that part was very definitely impacted my personal life. But then beyond that, we started to grow and it started to have organic life. It was just meaning the business had a, a life of its own, but it, it needed, it needed more attention in order to not impact the per, you know, my personal life. And when thinking back to the time when you were in that owner operator role, in what ways was that affecting your personal life? I remember at one point feeling so stressed that I remember asking my husband to tell me to to stop doing what I was doing, meaning like to to literally like walk away and Thankfully, he's too smart to, to take the bait on that, but I had to dig deep within myself and, well, not dig deep, actually zoom out and look at it, even though it felt stressful in that moment to zoom out and go, you know what, this is a good problem to have. How do we solve this problem and not to be mired in the problem anymore and to look for a solution and what is that solution and, and reject the fear that might come with, with growth or with making commitments and set that aside and go, you know what? This is too much for one person. Okay. Let's add another person. All right. We have a little gap in our, you know, in our skill set or in our service offering. All right. How do we fill that? And if it's the not, not the right decision or the right choice, then we'll deal with that. And so it's been an active process of going, okay, let, you know, like, let's do this, you know, really just stepping into the role and letting go of that fear of making a wrong choice or of all the things that a business owner can be fearful of, which are, which can be many. Um, and just going, all right, let's, let's dig in, you know, let's do this. We, if there are many successful firms out there, so let's, let's be one of them. Hey, Architect Nation, real fast. I want to draw your attention to May 1st through the 3rd, 2019. I'm hosting the Architect Business Summit in Chicago, Illinois, and I would love to meet you there in person. During these three days, some of the most successful architects I've had the pleasure of working with will pull back the curtain to reveal what they're doing to grow their income, freedom, and impact as firm owners. This will be the must-attend event for architecture firm owners in 2019. You won't want to miss this. Go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash live to get information on who will be speaking and find out how to grab your ticket. In terms of the transition, Aaron, going from the owner operator where you made that mental decision uh, to run your life and your business, basically the business a different way, Looking back, what would you say were the step-by-step -step key things that you did to be able to get you to where you are right now? I think the first thing 
as I just mentioned, is letting go of the fear. And the second thing is to ask for help. And that might start with, for me, it started with other people that I know that are business owners. And then it started with getting business coaching, you know, realizing that for me, a lot of the gaps came in the financial uh, decisions and components and framework in terms of how to run a business. So just ask for help, get help, hire help. What in terms of getting input in how to run a business when we're, we're not trained to do that in school. So just study it, pick up some books um, and, you know, and, and dig in. I think those are the, the, you know, the two big steps. And then from there, hopefully you glean enough information to lean into the coaching and the process and hopefully you're connected with somebody who can really help you set up the, the areas of, of a successful firm that you need to grow and move forward. And then from there, I think you just continue to revise and revisit that intentionality that can come with knowing what you're trying to do. And it's just a constant then making sure that you're realigning and you're learning and you learn something and you revise and then you go forward, learn, revise, go forward and, and sort of starting that process and allowing, giving yourself the grace to know that it's okay to make a mistake. And then you learn and you readjust, you know, it's kind of like sailing. I feel like you, I'm not a sailor, but I see people sailing, you know, near where I live and, you know, it's just adjusting those sails and you have to have the, the courage to put up the sail and you have to observe what's around you. Hopefully you can learn from some people. And then it's really just, you know, pulling and adjusting and tacking. And it's, you know, it's a little bit, it might be feel like you're going one direction and another, but keep an eye on the fact that you're, you're moving forward. And it's, you know, as some people say, it's up and to the right, you know, you're, you're the, there's growth, there's momentum and you just have to harness it. And how would you describe your business as it is now, Erin? The business as it is now is feels like it's thriving. It's it's profitable. It was profitable last year. It's going to be profitable again uh, this year based on our projections. It's healthy. The inner office environment has a lot of energy and momentum. Uh, the designs that we're doing are kind of inspiring all of us in a, in a fun way. It, so we're, we're having a really good time and it's, it's fun to see. You made a halfway, halfway through the program, uh, you made this interesting comment on one of our group calls where you said, uh, I'm actually achieving my vision faster than I thought it than I thought I was going to. And this is a bit of a challenge. Uh, can you tell me about that, what you meant by that and what that was like? You know, at the, uh, as you know, the, at the beginning of the program, we write out, uh, a vision for ourselves. So a lot of the vision was easy for me to fill in because it was, they were things that I'd already, you know, personal vision points that I had founded the, the firm on. But because there were lines available and sort of sections available, I started filling in some of those dreamy things that, that people dream about. And this section happened to be regarding uh, personal kind of personal acquisitions and, and goals. And they seemed like things that would take years and years to achieve. And I just wrote them down sort of intuitively or just, you know, just wrote them down really quickly on, on the paper and, and, and moved forward. And rather than taking four years to implement the way that I thought they would when I was setting, you know, the dates relative to the goals within months, these, you know, so one thing was to, uh, you know, acquire a vacation property in a, in a certain area in a certain neighborhood. And, um, you know, I thought, Oh, you know, someday, well, if, you know, if we have enough profit here and we can do this, well, you know, maybe that could happen. Well, suddenly it was, it was happening. So, a homeowner reached out, wanted to sell. We were able to 
um, to make it happen and to renovate that property using the profits from the company last year. And so it was literally, it was just all happening so fast that it felt amazing that, or to literally just throw an idea or several ideas onto paper and then just start seeing those things happening so fast. And then another way it was, you know, wanting to um, expand a certain part of our design offering and then finding the right employee to align with that. And, you know, it, it was, the struggle was having the, you know, the, just being open enough to all those things to allow them to happen. Meaning like sometimes those type of projects and hiring new employees and they can, they can take a little bit more work to invest in or a little bit more bandwidth um, both in time and, um, financial commitment at the outset, but it was amazing how quickly the things, it was, I think it was within six months that so many of the things on the vision story had happened that I had to go back and revisit it again and put new material on there because what I thought would take a few more years had already sort of come to fruition. And Aaron, do you think this is something that's special to you that somehow you're unique in this regard, or do you feel that this is something that any other architect could accomplish? Tell me about that. It's definitely not unique to me, but I've been inspired by hearing other business owners or architecture firm owners, or even seeing people on our calls, uh, you know, our weekly AFF calls who are so inspirational and so, you know, strong each in their own unique ways that knowing that those people are out there really inspires me to go, okay, other people are doing that. I can do that too. So obviously if I'm thinking that, then I feel that that's what everyone else should be thinking as well. There are, you know, other people, if other people can do it, you know, then you can do it too. I really think that that is the, uh, it, it's not any, it's not anything um, unique to the people that have been able to implement it. It's just a matter of, again, committing to doing it and knowing that it's possible and then figuring out what the next steps are. Moving from overwhelmed kind of in the business operations, which was years ago, now moving to empowered owner, uh, how has that affected your personal life? It continues to, it's, the empowerment on the business side has a, an amazing impact on how I see myself in my personal, in my personal life. Um, knowing that we're able to achieve things for our family through the, through the work that I'm committing to, rather than despite the work that I'm committing to, is huge. Um, so to be able to feel like a meaningful contributor who's also living my best life outside of work feels like, uh, I mean, it's just a huge win. So yes, there's, there's definitely a carryover between being able to, you know, be empowered in business and be empowered as a, you know, a parent, a wife, a friend. Um, so it, it, it touches everything. So you described before, feeling a bit overwhelmed, even getting to the point where you're, you're at begging, telling your husband, please tell me just to walk away from this. And uh, fortunately, you stuck through, you are starting to see the light on the other end of the tunnel, and you're having these positive benefits in your life. You know, from what you learned in the program and other things you've implemented, what would you say would be kind of the biggest takeaways, if you haven't already touched on them, to be able to craft your business the way it is now and, and experiencing the success that you're really having as a firm owner? The biggest thing I would say is to encourage someone to be intentional early. You know, again, I've started out very intentional on one aspect, but not as intentional on the business side. And for me, my only wish was that I could get that time back of the years that it took to, to figure that out, to, you know, to get help, get intentional, and to, to really find a place to thrive. So I, I would say I wish that I, I'd say that's one piece of advice to, 
to, to reach out and connect with somebody who can, who can help answer questions, especially as a sole proprietor, it can be a bit lonely. And so having some type of framework to drive decision making and to drive the vision of where the, the firm's headed is a huge peace of mind. Um, the other the other thing I would say is just to pick up the, the Profit First book. Um, that was hugely impactful in a, just a very direct way um, for me in terms of realizing that, you know, how to make a, a firm or entity uh, profitable. Um, I mean, that's just a, a, a big win and something that I think uh, everybody could, could benefit from. Awesome. And we do help people do that in the program. For those of you that uh, didn't catch that, the book is Profit First. You can find that on Amazon or any of your favorite booksellers. Aaron, before the call, you were telling me you guys have just won uh, a really exciting commission that you're excited about, a mixed-use project. Uh, you have a lot of other really cool projects going on. Where do you see the firm going from here? We see, so the foundations that we've laid in the AFF program, which are amazing, you know, we touched on some of the components, the vision, um, there's a lot of process involved, um, the foundations that we've laid in the, in the program, and we really are looking forward to drilling down into those um, even more. I think it will be a continual process of building on those foundations and going deeper and deeper into the processes and into the vision and into, you know, being a more conscious entity, you know, in terms of our, our employers, or excuse me, employees. Um, and so we really want to kind of continue to fine tune what we're doing. Um, we have probably some growth ahead of us uh, this year. The goal though is to be intentional and to keep our focus relatively narrow and just to go as deep as we can in that in that niche and so we are just excited to see that happening and we're just you know building on what we've learned on the aff program awesome well thanks for joining us today aaron thank you for sharing your amazing story thanks and that is a wrap since you've listened this far i know that you care about running a profitable, impactful, and successful architecture practice. And so that's why I know that you'll love the two free online training seminars that I've prepared specifically for architecture firm owners who are listeners to the podcast. The first training teaches you how to go from overwhelmed operator into empowered firm owner. You can get access to this training, free access, by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar. There's no spaces there. It's just forward slash freedom webinar. In the second online training you can get access to, you'll discover how to create a marketing system that works for your architecture firm to consistently bring in the kind of high quality project inquiries that you would like to attract to your firm. You can watch this from the comfort of your home or your office, and it also comes approved by the AI so you can get learning unit credits as well. Go to freearchitectgift.com. As always, the views on this show expressed by the guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.